Shabbat Shalom, everyone. The title of today's message is Mysticism, Being Led by the Spirit and Spiritual Gifts. My approach to this subject will be different than most people's. The reason being is twofold. One is due to what I have seen happening in the body of Messiah ever since I entered into it. And the other is due to my trying to understand this subject. So in a nutshell, we will be reverse engineering this subject matter. I am looking at where we're at right now and trying to find the path that we took to get here. And I realize that this may at times put me at odds with those who have a greater understanding of this subject matter due to the fact that I am looking at this matter in reverse. And that is fine. I am not attempting to pass myself off as a scholar on this subject matter. And one last thing before we start, I am not passing judgment on anyone concerning this matter. I am just desirous that we take a look at this subject and by doing so, we may look at ourselves. As the scripture says, but if we judged ourselves correctly, we would not be judged. This is by no means an exhaustive study on just this portion, portion much less the topic in general. Scripture readings will come from starting in Galatians chapter five and verse 16. In contradistinction to the teachers, I, Paul, say to you, lead your daily life guided by the spirit and in this way, you will not end up carrying out the impulsive desire of the flesh. For the flesh is actively inclined against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Indeed, these two powers constitute a pair of opposites at war with one another, the result being that you do not actually do the very things you wish to do. If, however, in the daily life of your communities, you are being consistently led by the Spirit, then you're not under the authority of the law. The effects of the flesh are clear, and these effects are fornication, vicious immorality, uncontrolled debauchery, the worship of idols, belief in magic, instances of irreconcilable hatred, strife, resentment, outbursts of rage, mercenary ambition, dissensions, separation into divisive cliques, grudging envy of the neighbor's success, bouts of drunkenness, nights of carousing, and other things of the same sort. In this regard, I warn you now, just as I warned you before, those who practice things of this sort will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. By contrast, the fruit born of, by the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faith, gentleness, and self-control. The law does not forbid these kinds of things, and those who belong to the Messiah Yeshua have crucified the flesh together with its passions and its desires. And just a short portion from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same master. And there are varieties of activities, but the same Elohim who works all things in all people. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is beneficial to all. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another a word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But in all these things, one and the same spirit is at work, distributing to each one individually, just as he wishes. We've noticed that the apostle calls us to lead our daily life guided by the Holy Spirit, so that we will not give ourselves over to the impulsive desires of the flesh. When a person seeks to live their life led by the Spirit, that person is living what we call the Spirit-led life. But what about mysticism? 
Wikipedia defines mysticism as the, the practice of religious ecstasies, which are religious experiencing during alternate states of consciousness, together with whatever ideologies, ethics, rites, myths, legends, and magic may be related to them. It may also refer to the attainment of insight in ultimate or hidden truths and to human transformation supported by various practices and experiences." End of quote. If we desire to inherit the kingdom of heaven, then I believe, as I am sure most believers do, that we should be living a spirit-led life. Does seeking to live a spirit-led life make one a mystic? Could there be any issues? And if there are, what should I be looking for? Is there anything that I can start with or to help us start with on this journey? And yes, there is a starting place. But like I said earlier, we are going to reverse engineer our way to an understanding. So we need to look for something that we can recognize and start our questioning from there. The first question we must ask ourselves is, what spirit is leading me? As one who started his journey out of Christianity and eventually made his way into the Hebrew roots messianic community over two decades ago, at times I wonder if people have really stopped and asked themselves that question. And I say this because of all the things that I have seen. I have wondered for a long time how we as a community have gotten to where we are at. It bothers me greatly of all the divisions I see. And it's not only the number of divisions, but also why some assemblies are divided. And as I have watched what is going on, I came to the realization that this messianic Hebrew roots type assemblies in some ways are not that much different from a reformed or Pentecostal congregation of comparable size. Now I know that there are different days of worship, the use of titles instead of the name and differences in liturgy, but the people that is the leader, leaders and laity are a lot of light in how they seek to draw closer to the one we call our father. The pious in both camps will spend time in prayer, scripture study, singing worship songs, and seeking to do good deeds. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of this. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> these are all excellent things that every believer in Messiah should be doing. But if we are having the same issues that most denominations have, then we must have some things in common which are hurtful to the community at large. And if we share in these hurtful things, then we need to see if we can find out what is the source behind it. And this is not the first time that the body of Messiah has had problems with other influences. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, gave at least eight sermons against Judaizing. Now in the time that he lived, it was still common for those coming into Christianity out of paganism to end up going into Judaism. And even though there were differences and some of them very major, new converts would get caught up in what was happening with their Jewish neighbor and they would end up converting. And just for the record, the same thing is still true in our time. A teacher who helped me come into the Messianic faith ended up converting to Judaism. In a book that I have from him, the last chapter deals with ways to ensure one does not leave the Messianic faith and convert to Judaism. He is now a rabbi who teaches Kabbalah, and yes, he has denied the Messiah. But today I do not want to go in that direction. We will do that at another time. What I want to speak about today deals with what we bring over from our time in Christianity. We share with them a way of 
communicating with Yahweh and with other believers through the Holy Spirit. One of the ways this is done is through the gift of tongues. Some believers will use the gift of speaking in tongues to enhance their prayer life and their everyday life. And others will use it doing services to relay a message from heaven. And most of those who are of the messianic persuasion have brought this gift of tongues over from their days in Christianity. And those who did not speak in tongues as they entered our community have learned about it from someone who did bring it over from their days as a Christian. Now speaking in tongues is mentioned in scripture a number of times and I'm not here to either prove or disprove it. But what I'm going to talk about today is that speaking in tongues does not necessarily mean that a person is speaking words from the throne of heaven. Now, first we need to understand that when a person is speaking in tongues or praying in a tongue, they are being possessed by a spirit. Possession can either happen by invitation or invasion. Those who are being possessed are being used by that spirit for a purpose. Now, in case you're wondering about this, let us look at Acts chapter 4, and beginning in verse 29, we read, the apostles are praying, and now, Master, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Yahshua. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of Elohim with all boldness. If we were to look for an example that is more of a one-sided affair, we can look to the book of the Apocalypse. After writing to the seven churches, we read in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, After this, I had a vision of an open door to heaven, and I heard the trumpet-like voice that had spoken to me before, saying, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen afterwards. At once I was caught up in the Spirit. So as we can see from scriptures, how this comes about can happen in different ways. Now secondly, the person doing the speaking is a messenger. Now I'm using these words possessed, messenger, in a very neutral manner. Just because someone is possessed does not mean an evil entity is involved, and being a messenger is not an evil act in and of itself. Another word that is used to describe this type of messenger is medium. The term medium itself is also neutral. It depends, as do those other words, on the person and the spirit involved. A prime example of this is when the prophets in the Old Testament spoke, thus says Yahweh. When they said this, they were saying that they were the medium or the messenger by which the word of Yahweh was coming to the children of Israel. Now what I want us to consider is what is happening now in our community. Most of those whom I have met, and there have been quite a few, entered this community with the gift of speaking in tongues. And I've had the pleasure to talk to them about this. These same people now talk about the era that those that they have left are still in. So my question becomes, how could the spirit of truth have been speaking through you as you were speaking in tongues when you yourself admit you were in error? Amen. Now, some of these people that I have met have been speaking in the same language for decades. And it is the same language that they spoke what, what in now they consider to be when they were in error. Now, some will say that because they were rebaptized, that they are no longer under the influence of that spirit anymore. So we must ask the questions. If that is the case, then how can anyone backslide? And if coming to the truth and being rebaptized 
keeps a person from falling under the influence of a spirit that once kept him captive, and then they relapse back into that sin, then they are either not in the truth still, or their baptism was invalid for some reason. So how can anyone fall into moral sin then? As we start, are we to start following a form of Calvinism then just so we can bust, justify what we are doing? You know, the kind that says that we sin because God has ordained it for us to sin, so we have to. That's the kind of Calvinism I'm talking about. May heaven forbid that. That road leads to double predestination, which means that when you were in the womb, your fate was decided. So yeah, going down that path says it does not matter how you live in this life because you cannot change your final destination. Some people still use the same spirit language they had while in error. And by this, I mean that none of their words have changed. So we have to ask ourselves, is it possible that what Yahweh once considered to be wrong, he now considers to be right just because someone has come to an understanding of the truth they did not have? Does Yahweh actually change? Is Yahweh as fickle as the gods of Egypt, Babylon, and the other nations that surrounded Israel? Would Yahweh not expect the one coming to the truth to realize that they were in error and turn from it? Now, when I've talked to different people about this, they have said that they prayed to Yahweh that they wanted the gift if it was from him. In other words, they set conditions on their receiving the gift and they wanted it to have Yahweh's approval. They did not, under any circumstances, want anything that was false. Well, they're okay then, right? I mean, obviously we believe that the apostles in Acts 4 received the spirit of Yahweh and not some other entity. So if we ask like that, we should be okay, right? Well, think about Solomon. It was Yahweh who came to him and asked him what he wanted. He said he wanted wisdom to rule Yahweh's people. Yahweh said okay, and then said he would bless him with wealth, peace from his enemies, and long life. Well, look how that turned out. It got so bad that Israel was divided on account of him. And now Yahweh knew before giving those things to him how it would turn out. So even when we get things the right way, it doesn't mean that there will not be an issue down the road. One of the things that normally happens when a person speaks in a tongue is that there is an interpretation. The interpretation is when those in attendance get to hear the meaning of what was spoken. The Apostle Paul says that when something is spoken in a tongue and an interpretation is given, he puts it on a level with prophecy. In some ways, prophecy and the use of tongues are similar in that they're in their use, there is a revealing. One of a language that was not understood and the other reveals the will of Yahweh, whether by clear explaining of his word or by revealing an event that will transpire. I want to take a couple of, a look at a couple of things which happened in scripture. This first example deals with King Ahab as he prepares to go to battle with King Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18, they have sent for the prophet Micaiah. And it says, quote, then the messenger went to call Micaiah and said to him, behold, the words of the prophets are good with one voice to the king. Please let your word be as one with them and speak good. And Micaiah said, as Yahweh lives, only what my El has said, that will I speak. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to war or shall I cease? And he said, go up and triumph, they shall be given into your hand. But the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak nothing except the truth in the name of Yahweh? 
take a little break right here. Notice what is happening. Micaiah has told the messenger that was sent to get him that he is only going to speak what Yahweh has said and then proceeds to tell Ahab something wrong. Now Ahab then calls him out on it and says, tell me what Yahweh has said. Even Ahab understood certain things about the spirit, even if he didn't listen to it. Then we will come back to this section on another day. Then he said, Micaiah, I saw all Israel scattered upon the mountains like sheep that had no shepherd. And Yahweh said, these have no masters. Let each of them return to his own house in peace. Then the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not say to you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but only disaster? Then Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting upon his throne with all the host of heaven, standing on his right and on his left. And Yahweh said, Who will entice Ahab, the king of Israel, that he would go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this and another said that. Then a spirit came forth and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. Then Yahweh said to him, by what means? Then he said, I will go forth and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you will entice him and you will also succeed. Go out and do so. So now behold, Yahweh has put a spirit of deception into the mouths of these your prophets. Yahweh has spoken disaster against you. We well, notice that the prophets were prophesying good news and victory for the kings. They were actually speaking what Yahweh wanted them to say. They were saying that they were speaking what Yahweh wanted them to say, and they were actually telling the truth. Yahweh did want them to say what they did. Yahweh can and does send delusions to people to bring about their downfall and also repentance. Those who interpret a tongue are much like all of those prophets, including Micaiah. They believe that what they are saying is the interpretation, the message, if you will, of what Yahweh is saying to his people. I spent a few years in a oneness Pentecostal church, and I cannot remember one time when an interpretation was given and the message was somebody needs to repent. I've heard many interpretations in the Hebrew roots and none of them have ever said that the assembly needed to seek Yahweh with a pure heart, much less the need for repentance. Of course, the words of Micaiah came to pass according to the will of Yahweh, just like the words of Agabus came to pass. In the book of Acts, we read where Agabus prophesied concerning a famine, famine to come to Jerusalem. That's in Acts chapter 11 and verses 27 and 28. And concerning the trial that the apostle Paul was about to face, that's in Acts 21 chapters 10 and 11. So by this, we do know that Yahweh does speak through those whom he has chosen. The hard part for us is to ensure that something is not going on that is causing the message to be a trap. Being spiritual and seeking the will of Yahweh in a matter, it puts us in a realm where we can brush up against a spirit that can lead us down a wrong path. When we are around those displaying their spiritual gifts, we need to make sure that we have our guard up as to what is being done and said. Just because we are children of, of Yahweh does not mean that we are afforded special protection from other spirits and deception. Yahweh will allow us to be tempted and tried, but he will have made a way for us to get out of it. So for us, the question then becomes, will we recognize the way out when we come upon it? All that I have been able to do this day is to try to help you to look at the outside shell of an extremely complicated matter. The more that I have looked, 
the more questions I come up with and the fewer easy answers I seem to find. Just how complicated you may wonder this is get. Remember the example I gave of those who spoke in tongues while they were Christians and then speak the same tongue now that they have come into the truth? When they spoke, a translation was given. What if the translation was wrong? What if they were speaking that they would soon be leaving to honor Yahweh and his commandments? We may never know in this life. That's the reason why I said I'm not here to judge any part of this. I just want us to take a look at it. Maybe that is why the Apostle Paul said he would much rather speak five understandable words than 10,000 that were unintelligible. And I realize that some of this may have come across as unintelligible. And for that, I beg your forgiveness. Now, some people will say that if we ask Yahweh to keep us from speaking in tongues, if it is not from him, then he will do it. You know, I am sure that the man who helped me come into the knowledge of truth was praying to Yahweh as he was looking at and then eventually converted into Judaism. This is difficult. It seems at times that Yahweh, if we continue to push, Yahweh is no longer under any obligation to prevent any spirit from speaking through us or to keep us from being led down a study that we do not need to do. The more that I have looked at this, the more that I have come to realize is that even scripture study is a spiritual work that at times is mystical and we can be led astray even as we are praying not to be. I'm not saying this happens often. It's just out there. What I hope I can make you see is that we are dealing with things that are more than just ourselves. There are entities that seek to draw people after them, just like the spirit of Yahweh calls us to follow him. All I'm asking is that you walk circumspectly during this time that you are here on this earth. It is my desire and my honest prayer that each of you fulfills your spiritual calling in the Messiah Yeshua and that you will be empowered by his Holy Spirit and that all that you do is to the honor and to the glory of Yahweh. But let us never forget to judge ourselves and be aware of all that is done by others around us. If Yahweh wills, we will continue this later. Let us pray. Almighty Father, I humbly come before you at this time and I pray that the words of my mouth have been pleasing unto you. Realizing, Father, that I've brought forth the subject that I do not have the greatest knowledge on. But, Father, I do pray for all of us at this time that as many spirits that are out there seeking to, to draw each and every one of us after themselves, that you will guard our hearts and minds, that you will help us to be aware, and that, Father, you will help draw us out of any error that we might be in or may be approaching to be in. Father, help us to see in the Spirit as you see. Help us to understand as you understand. And I beg you, Father, please have mercy upon us all, for we are your creation. And we love you, and we are seeking you, and to you only do we give our honor, our praise, and our thanks. In Yeshua's name, amen.